Welcome to Ear Crush, the Friday podcast for people who love listening to great stories. Thanks so much for being here again this week, and I'm glad that we're back on Friday since this is the Friday podcast. We released on Monday earlier this week, and I apologize for the delay. I know uh, some of you missed us last Friday. Before we get to the conclusion of Renegade, I want to let you know that the audiobook for Life Goes On, Cretharian Gambit, book number 21, was released a couple of days ago. So if you haven't already grabbed your copy, now's the time for some great weekend listening. And did you know that we have an LMBPN audio-specific email newsletter? You can sign up for that to be notified of new audiobook releases and other good stuff at lmbpn.com slash audio email. Again, that's lmbpn.com slash audio email. Or you can just look in the show notes for this episode and you'll find the sign up link. Okay, enough for me. Let's get to the conclusion of Renegade, written by Erica Everest and narrated for you by Meg Price. Chapter 2 I watch them from overhead, keeping my distance as I follow them, the fading light, no impediment to my enhanced eyesight. I see them reach the gates at the city limits and slip through before they are locked for the night. Once they are out of sight, I return to the site of the confrontation and reach inside my mind to connect with the well of power there. The gods revealed the source to us, and the priests taught us how to access it. I draw on that power and release the burning wrath. Of course, the green fire does no harm to the ground, but my brethren would be suspicious if I returned to them without such a flare. I regroup with the other Dracus on the far side of Infinity Park. When we are once again in formation, Drogon gives the signal and we fly back to the caves. There are many cave systems on this planet. This is a mountainous region, and the slopes nearby are riddled with holes and tunnels. The caves we live in were chosen by the priests to be our base when the first wave of Dracus came to this planet. The priests liked how the cramped, dark caves were reminiscent of the cocoons we were placed in while our metamorphosis took effect. They thought it would be comforting for us, Dracus, to recall that period in our lives. The specific caves we use were chosen simply because they were the nearest caves to the Metropolitan Zone. For the most part, the priests were correct in their assumptions about the desirability of the caves. My brethren all seem happy in their rocky home. Perhaps it is because I have no happy associations with the cocoon that I chafe against the constrictions of the caves. As far as I am aware, I am the only Dracus who completely metamorphosed without first having been an acolyte. Nearly all my contemporaries on my home world became acolytes in childhood, hoping they would prove themselves and either undergo metamorphosis to become Dracus or study the sacred text as priests. Very few ever progressed beyond the acolyte pool, though. In contrast, I had no interest in changing who I was or fighting the war against ignorance in some far-off place but my grasp of advanced mathematics and devotion to the golden spiral, coupled with my physical prowess, brought me to the attention of the high priest. He drafted me to join the Dracus, despite not having undergone acolyte training. When I emerged from the cocoon, months had passed, and I was already en route to this planet. I was part of the second wave of Dracus, who were brought in as reinforcements when it became clear that the natives here were resistant to accepting the teachings of the priests. That had been more than two of this planet's years ago. We land at the caves in reverse order of our takeoff, which means I am one of the last to enter. It also means my assigned sleeping spot is close enough to the entrance that if I crane my neck slightly, I can glimpse the stars. Seeing the stars and knowing I am not actually trapped under all this rock helps me suppress my claustrophobia. I try to sleep, but I cannot stop thinking about what the female Misandra said to me. It is the antithesis of everything I believe in. I repeat to myself firmly, so why can't I get her words out of my head? Why do her striking features dance in my vision? I did not pay much attention to her appearance when she was in front of me, but now, in the dark, I can't help remembering the riot of color as she streaks past me, 
Her brightly patterned clothing contrasts sharply with the monochromatic landscape, and her hair surrounds her head like a corona, disarrayed from her frantic run. Her violet eyes flash with anger and indignation as she yells at me. I do not know what the standard of beauty is on this world, but among my people, she would be considered beautiful, if a little small. Though, of course, everyone seems small to a Dracus, since we are ten feet tall. I shake my body as if that will dislodge the thoughts in my head. Can you really say, with all the rules binding you, that you are free? I have often thought privately of my forced enlistment as a form of slavery, but her question forces me to consider this in a stark new light. She thinks I'm following this path blindly, that I've been indoctrinated to the point that I cannot form my own judgments, but just because I don't want to fight the war does not mean I do not support the war. We are fighting the good fight. I believe in our purpose here. We have come to liberate this planet from the shackles of ignorance, to bring them peace and enlightenment. Why then do the people we are trying to help call us terrorists? If you ever decide you would like to gain direct knowledge of our so-called chaotic lives, you can find me. I wonder if spending time with the natives would help me form a deeper understanding of their perspective in order to gain insight about their hostile attitude towards us and how to overcome it. Would it be so wrong to sample a little bit of chaos if it was for the greater good? It is the antithesis of everything I believe in. I repeat once more. But I fall asleep dreaming of violet eyes. I do not see Missandra again, nor her sister Leela. I do not seek them out in the marketplace, though I often fantasize about what it would be like. I'm curious to see more of the world through her eyes, and intrigued by the concept of choice she described. I would like to learn more about it, but chaos is a subtle enemy. I know that simply discussing such topics risks my purity of thought. Such a betrayal would not be condoned by the Dracus. I would soon find myself sent on the final journey to the heart of the spiral, and I'm not ready to take that journey yet. I do my best to push her poisonous words from my mind, but they have burrowed deep and are hard to uproot. And every night, I dream of violet eyes. The days pass. There is nothing much to distinguish one day from the next. The Dracus continue our patrols and watch over the acolytes and the priests brought to this planet, who are transforming the metropolitan zone. We are clearing away the ramshackle and haphazard structures the natives cobbled together and replacing them with new dwellings that are perfectly proportioned to be aesthetically pleasing according to the golden ratio. The uniformity of the new construction is further enhanced by a new city layout which reflects the golden spiral, at least as far as the crude local building materials will allow. There has been some unrest in the metropolitan zone because of the construction, which is why the acolytes require our protection. Some of the natives have protested the removal of the decrepit buildings that they have been living in. They have not yet grasped the full vision the gods have for this city and the world that the priests are implementing. If the natives could only stop focusing on the past, they would see what we are doing here and weep with gratitude for the great honor bestowed on them. One day, news arrives that changes everything. The gods themselves will visit this planet to assess our progress in converting the heathens of this world. The priests are anxious to make a favorable impression, so the protesters' obstruction can no longer be tolerated. The priests want us to give a demonstration, showcasing our effectiveness and performance for the gods when they come. Combining these goals, the priests order the Dracus to arrest all protesters, and incarcerate them in the arena. It takes several days to round them all up. During that time, some of the chaos lovers try to hide to escape justice. But there is no escaping the Dracus. We are the gods' chosen race. My cohort is responsible for bringing one of the last groups of protesters in, and I escort the prisoners to their cells and secure them. As I am walking out to rejoin my cohort, I hear a soft voice call, Dracus. Though she is not shouting at me, I still recognize her voice instantly. 
I search for her among the crowded cells and finally catch sight of her. She pushes past the others in her cell to talk to me through the bars. Why are you here? I ask her in a low voice. I told you to stay on the path. It was not I who strayed. Comprehension dawns. Your sister. Is she here too? No. We got word that the raid was coming. It was not much notice, but enough for me to warn her. She got out, but I was caught up in the sweep when the Dracus descended on us. This is not right, I say, angry on her behalf. I will find Leela and bring her here so you can be released. She is the one who should be punished, not you. Don't you dare, she hisses at me, her violet eyes flashing with the heat of her anger. I am so distracted by them that I almost miss what she is saying. I chose to be here. I chose to sacrifice myself so my sister could be free. This is free will. This is love. Love is irrational, I point out. So is the golden ratio, she responds with a smirk, and I know the pun is intentional. I do not understand love. Her eyes widen as if my words have surprised her. Then that is the tragedy of your race, she said softly. I do not like the direction this conversation has taken, and I step back from her. I cannot save you again, Miss Sandra, I tell her briskly. Goodbye. I walk away without looking back, but I feel her eyes on me every step of the way. Chapter 3 The day of the gods' arrival is upon us. We Dracus stand in formation under the burning sun, while the priests flit among us, adjusting and perfecting, and eventually the gods walk past to inspect us. They do not stay long. They seem anxious to get out of the heat, too. The priests lead them to the welcome suite that had been prepared for them. I expect they will pay more attention to us during the so-called Cartherian Games, the demonstration we will give at the arena later. Finally, the last of the gods, priests, acolytes, and other hangers-on disappear from view, and Drogon gives us permission to return to the coolness of the caves. I do not know what to expect from the games, but I am certain the priests will direct us appropriately when the time comes. As the sun reaches its peak, Drogon gives us the order. We line up in our cohorts to launch ourselves into the sky and fly in formation to the arena. We touch down on the sand in a spiral pattern with Drogon in the center before spreading out to form a perfect perimeter around the arena. The gods are already assembled above us, and they give the signal to begin. The priests start calling instructions to us. The first part of the demonstration mimics our training sessions. A pair of Dracus are chosen to showcase a particular maneuver. Only seven pairs are called for this portion of the demonstration, and I am not among them. The fourteen who've already performed step back to allow the rest of us a moment to shine in the second phase of the demonstration. A gate on the far side of the arena opens, and several protesters are pushed into the arena. These are harbingers of chaos, the high priest announces in an amplified voice. Their words, their actions, their very existence undermines the order we have created here and the peace we have established. Enemies of the peace are enemies of the gods and shall feel their burning wrath. The first cohort springs into action. Each herds a prisoner away from the group and five columns of green fire ignite simultaneously. The crowds cheer raucously, and I realize that these are not games. This is an execution masquerading as entertainment. These are not actions of a savior bringing peace to a barbaric world. This is the subjugation of a sentient species. The first cohort step aside and allow the second cohort to take their turn. It is almost like a dance. The synchronization would be beautiful if it weren't so deadly. The green light cast by the burning wrath illuminates the next group of prisoners being ushered into the arena, and the violet eyes are unmistakable. Missandra is among those to be executed. My heart clenches. She does not deserve this. Whatever her reason for choosing to trade places with her sister, she could not have known this would be the consequence. The second cohort clears away, 
leaving the sands free for mine. I run toward her. I will let no one else claim her as a target. Perhaps I understand more than I have credited myself about choice and free will and sacrifice and maybe even love. I do not want her to die, but the only way to save her is to betray everything I value, and yet I do not hesitate. I have fallen so far from the path that I may never claw my way out of the abyss. I reach her and wrap my arms around her, holding her tightly against my body as I launch myself upward. I fly as high as I can, as quickly as possible. No one in the arena has realized my motives yet, and I intend to be far away before the pursuit begins. Misandra feels fragile against my much bigger body, but I know there is nothing fragile about her. She shouts at me, but the wind whips her words away. I fly us to another cave system, one I discovered accidentally when I was disorientated during a sandstorm many moons ago and had to take shelter until the storm passed. I know there is a freshwater stream and plenty of small prey in these caves, so we won't starve. I land and set down my precious cargo. She rounds on me. Have you lost your mind? How dare you abduct me like this? I need to get back. I need to find Leela. You have to take me back. They were going to execute you. I roar at her, and she flinches. I realize she is intimidated by my large form looming over her, and I do not want to frighten her, so I turn my focus inwards and let go of my warrior form. I am still enhanced, but my appearance is closer to what it was before my metamorphosis. In this form, I am only slightly taller than she. She stares at me, her jaw slack with amazement. It belatedly occurs to me that she is probably the only person on this planet who has seen one of us in this form. She seems to take courage from the fact that she is now at eye level with me and that I have made no aggressive moves towards her. She scrutinizes my face, perhaps trying to trace the similarities between my two forms. Her hand twitches at her side and I realize she wants to touch, so I nod to give her permission. I am loath to break the silence between us and risk restarting the shouting. When she raises her hand to my face, her touch is hesitant, but gentle. I cannot read the reaction I see in her eyes. Were they really going to execute me? She asks softly. Yes, I reply in the same tone. Ten of your fellow protesters were burned to ash before you were brought into the arena. There's no point in sugarcoating the truth. From all I have seen of her, she would not appreciate the omission. I have to go back, she whispers. You can't, I say. You were under a death order, and now so am I. Here is the only place that is safe for us now. If I hadn't been literally blown in by that storm, I would never have known about these caves. We can stay as long as we need to. The Dracus won't find us here. But Leela, she pleads, her voice catching. She needs me. I can't abandon her. Then we will get her too, I hear myself say. We will extract her and bring her back here to safety. And the others? She asks. What about them? The others? My people don't want to be bound by the spiral. They are ready to rise up, but they need a leader to show them the way. I frown. No one deserves to be a slave to the path my gods are trying to oppose on these people. But you're talking about revolution. No, Missandra says with a smile that is full of possibilities. I'm talking about freedom. Epilogue In the inner sanctum of their temple, soundproofed and barricaded against the priests and acolytes alike, the leaders of the Zebulon clan gathered to review the day's unsatisfactory events. Since they broke from the rest of the Seven many centuries ago, this clan of Cartherians had traveled from world to world looking for suitable recipients of their enhancements. From each species they collected data and refined their process accordingly until they created the Dracus. The demonstration had been meant to prove that they finally had the right formula, and they were most displeased that it had failed. Whose bright idea was it to give them wings? The first leader demanded. 
that would be yours, 1.6, the third leader replied with a sneer. The first leader bristled at the abbreviation. They all had names related to components of the golden ratio, the universal mathematical concept that they revered above all. But only he, as first leader, could claim the full value of the ratio as his name. Of course, since it was an irrational number, it wasn't possible to say the entirety of his name, but to truncate it to just one decimal place was an insult. We all agreed that the ability to fly would provide additional maneuverability and versatility after our experiments with the raptors. The second leader interjected. He sighed. It is a pity the raptors didn't work out. They had such promise. I agree, Route 5, but the bipedal base model has been much better for our purposes, the first leader said, especially now that we have combined the wings from the raptors with the hybrid form we developed on the planet in the Pan Galaxy. I really feel that these Dracus represent the pinnacle of our evolutionary enhancement program. But what should we do about the deserter 1.61803? The sixth leader asked, bringing them back to the problem at hand. Do his actions indicate a flaw in the programming somewhere? The physical design is correct, but perhaps we built too much autonomy into the physiological template, the first leader mused. He thought for a moment, then came to a decision. Effective immediately. All Dracus must undergo additional enhancement sessions to strengthen their directive to comply and obey and reduce their ability to think independently. They will be the perfect soldiers. And the renegade? The first leader smiled cunningly. We all saw what triggered his reaction. For some reason, that female is important to him. However, my scribes have been busy gathering information, and what is important to that female is her young sister. She is still in the city and will soon be in our custody. Control the sister, control the female. Control the female, control the renegade. We will bring him back to the fold. And whoever controls the Dracus will control the universe. Author Notes Renegade by Erica Everest for me, 2017 was the year of shattering preconceptions. Preconception 1. Self-publishing equals vanity publishing. Ha, huh, I couldn't have been more wrong. I was about six years late discovering the publishing revolution. I only really joined in last May. I had heard that self-publishing was now more acceptable and mainstream, but I hadn't really accepted that for myself. I still believed that the only right way to get your story out there was to find an agent and wait for them to find you a deal with a publisher. Then I found a book called Death Becomes Her, and my world changed. Preconception number two. Author notes are just a place for desperate nobodies to beg for reviews. So at the end of Death Becomes Her, this guy, Michael Anderley, wrote about how he just stuck the book on Amazon, and I thought, it's really that easy to get your story out there? No agent required? At the end of the second book, Michael talked about sales and revenue streams, giving a glimpse inside the author's world. Subsequent author notes gave more updates and insights on sales, but also on fan reactions, collaborations, and spin-offs, and the team that was growing around his fantastic series. It made me feel connected to the series in a way no other series had achieved because it lifted the curtain and showed behind the scenes, and I wanted more. So I contacted Michael on Facebook and asked if I could join his team. Two days later, I was added to the JIT, proofreading team. Michael has created a wonderful universe, but he has created an even better community. I have learned so much being a part of it, and made some great friends too, and all because Michael used his author notes to break the wall between author and reader. Preconception number three, there is no way I could have a story written by a deadline. The Fans Write for Fans concept was launched in September 2017, but somehow I missed it. I found it in December, and the deadline for submissions for the first volume was December 20th. I was trying to finish the first book in my series of fairy tale mashups, so I said, 
maybe I'll do something for the second volume, if there is one, and left it at that. Or so I thought. Back in July, Michael shared a draft of what would become Holly's Savior with the JIT, and an idea for my own story set in the Carthinian universe came to me. I wrote about 300 words, then forgot about it. But with all the hype leading up to the submission deadline, I couldn't get it out of my head. So, on December 15th, I posted that snippet in the Fans Write Facebook group to see if it was worth pursuing. The feedback I got from the others in the group spurred me on. I suddenly decided that it didn't matter that there were only five days to deadline, that I'm a slow writer, or that I had no idea where the story was going after that first scene. I was going to make every effort to finish it in time to submit for the first volume. I submitted it at 11 p.m. Eastern Time, around 4 a.m. for me, on December the 20th, just before the submission window closed. And I realized that when I put my mind to it, I can achieve so much more than I thought I could, and that the biggest obstacles in my way are my own preconceptions about what is and isn't possible. A huge thank you to Michael Anderley for not only creating the Carthurian universe, but for being generous enough to allow us to play in it too. Thanks to Natalie Roberts, who unknowingly inspired me to write this story in the first place, Sarah Weir, for the questions and comments on the first draft that made the story so much stronger, and to James Kaplan for his insights and feedback during the revision stages. To Kimberly, Kelly, Mickey, Joshua, John, and all of the JIT team, thank you for the feedback, encouragement, and most importantly, friendship you have shared with me. Finally, thanks to Lynn Stiegler, editor extraordinaire, Martha Carr, awesome author, and Steve Campbell, champion coordinator, for all they have taught me, directly and by osmosis, about writing in general and indie publishing in particular. I have been writing on and off for years, whenever the voices in my head get too loud and need to escape onto paper, but this is the first story that I've had published. Now I have the bug, and I'm going to keep at it. I'm aiming to publish the first three books in my fairy tale series this summer, and who knows after that? So, the most important thank you of all goes to you, the reader, for taking a chance on some unknown authors by reading this anthology, and in doing so, inspiring me to keep shattering those preconceptions and reach for the stars. Erica Everest <laughs>